Thank you very much. So I am so excited to be in the room with people who care about education, and I'm not here to talk about technology. So I hope that's not a huge disappointment, but you're going to have someone else talk about te technology later. I'm going to talk to you about everything that we saw in that What If video around a completely new perspective on dealing with the challenges we face in education. So um, the project and the process I'm going to tell you about is what we've been doing in South Africa called Partners for Possibility. But let me start by just connecting us with regard to South Africa. So I hope that most people in the room know that South Africa is that small country right at the bottom of Africa. So often people talk about Africa as if it's one country. It's not. It's many different countries. And South Africa is at the bottom. And when, you're, when I talk about South Africa, many of you may remember the World Cup. So we hosted an amazing World Cup in 2010. Was anybody there? No. People, a few. A few hands. Um, we're also a country with beautiful uh, wildlife and nature, so many of you will have heard about our lions and our elephants. We're a country that, um, where Nelson Mandela came from. You saw the quote earlier, Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon to change the world. It's the home of Desmond Tutu. It's a country that has amazing gifts with regard to natural resources, but also our financial and business environment is, is world class by any standard. So this is um, some statistics that come from the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report that shows that we're number one in the world out of, or out of 148 <coughs> countries for the strength of our auditing and reporting standards. And we're number two in the world with regard to the availability of financial services. So that's the good news. So let me tell you the bad news about South Africa. We're number 146 out of 148 countries with, for, for the quality, rated as for the quality of our education system. And we're number 148 out of 148 countries for the quality of our maths and science education. Now that's a, that's a very striking thought, and I'm hoping that everybody in this room is paying attention to this statistic, because this is not who we are as a nation, it's not who we are as a country, but it is the experience of the large majority of children in the South African school system. So the question that we asked ourselves is, if we can achieve these amazing statistics, if we can be number one in the world for the quality of our auditing and reporting standards, number two in the world for our, for our um, availability of financial services, and many other statistics that shows that we really are at the top of our class with regard to business, can we actually address the issues in education? And the question we ask ourselves is, can we tap into our national assets to deal with one of the most significant challenges facing our country. Because this issue, as you can imagine, the fact that our education system is completely broken is having an impact on every other aspect of our, of our country. So we have very high levels of high um, unemployment. We have uh, very, very big issues with regard to our university students not, not actually passing as they, when they go to university because they're not ready for um, a university. We also have a very big skills issue. And then we have uh, high levels of poverty, extreme high levels of, levels of poverty. And all of these are ultimately linked to education. So to give you a sense of our basic education system, and as you know, the basic education op system obviously flows into our, our higher education. We have one uh, national um, department. We have nine provincial departments, 72 districts. 27,000 schools, more or less, in our public education system, uh, about 500,000 teachers and 12 million children. And the question we had to ask ourselves is, if you want to turn around and transform this broken system with these kind of numbers, how do you do that? We have 22,000 schools that are deemed to be failing. And as I often say to international audiences, when I say that they are failing, it means that the children in those schools cannot read at grade level. Most of our grade sixes in our country cannot read at grade level and will probably never be able to. Now, if you can't read at grade level in grade six, it goes, it's easy for all of us to understand that you will then struggle at university if you ever get the chance to go to university. Because what we do in South Africa, because we don't have the capacity to deal with children at lower grades, we keep pushing them up 
out and of um, the one million children that enter our school system every year, about only 500,000 make it to matric to our final year, and the others fall off along the way. So the question we had to ask ourselves is how do you transform a system with 22,000 broken schools? And the only answer we could get to is you do that one school at a time. And what we needed to do, and this is, this is verified by many international um, authors and, and educational experts. So the, 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 the next question then is, but how do you do that? If you, you know, that's a big number, and we don't have the resources in our country to send consultants into these 22,000 schools. So this question around how do you transform 22,000 failing schools is a big question for South Africa, as you can imagine. And I'm sure that that's a question that many of you are grappling with in your countries. I, I often find it amazing when I talk to um, these big superpowers that they, still, that they also struggle with the same issues. So what I'm hoping I'm going to share with you today is going to be transferable into your world. So we go back to this picture. It's a big, big question for us. Now, we believe we're going to do this in South Africa by bringing, by tapping into the knowledge and skills in our business sector. And I know that many of you think that business and education are, there's this big divide and we can't bring them together. Now, we are seeing that when you do bring business and education together, miracles happen. So I'm a, just a quick story about myself. I'm a homecomer, which means that I, I lived in the UK. I did my doctorate. I saw there was someone from the University of Hertfordshire. I doctor, did my doctorate in large complex social change at the University of Hertfordshire. Went back to South Africa, took my two beautiful daughters back to South Africa. And I, as we arrived in South Africa, I was confronted with the reality of how of the broken, this broken system, and I realized that my two children will be able to look at me one day and say, Mom, you knew what to do with this. What did you do? So that was a big call to action for me. And I think there's a big call to action for, for the role of business, because business over the last few decades have been scrappling with how do we lead large-scale change, and we've not been bringing that into the education space. So our proposition is a partnership between business, government, and civil society that will lead to radically improved education outcomes within a decade. And we've started to see these outcomes, um, improved outcomes in South Africa in the 155 schools where we're working um, in ways that are astonishing everybody that, that's being presented with this information. So firstly, we have a theory of change. It's based on asset-based community development that says if we could somehow make the school the center of community, the school could become a magnet for the gifts and contributions of the people in that community. And if we could somehow change the story in our communities from lack and deficiency to gifts and contribution, something miraculous will happen. Often I, I have conversations with people around, what is the role of education? What is the role of our schooling system? And we've come to the agreement that if the schooling system could help our children discover what they're good at, education will have real value, rather than have our children talk about what they're bad at and what their deficiencies are. And the same thing is true about our education system and the schools in South Africa. So we wanted to do that. We wanted to change our schools to become the center of community, and we wanted our schools to be the magnet for the gifts and contribution for people in the community. And we knew that the principal, the role of the school principal, is critical in the space. And if we could somehow get these 22,000 principals to be these community leaders, something will happen in those schools. But then we realized that in South Africa, our principals are not equipped for their task as community leaders. And we had no, there's no way how we could somehow miraculously overnight send all these 22,000 people off to business school and, and university. So we needed to find a, a much more innovative solution. And our innovative solution is the following. We said, again, coming back to this idea, we said that we have a national asset. And our national asset is that we have thousands of business leaders in South Africa who have been equipped for their task as change leaders and who have had much experience of leading change. And these business leaders are committed to their own development and they want to make a contribution to the issues facing our country. So we said, well, if, if that's a national asset we have and we know that our principals need support, they need to be equipped and supported for their task, 
Maybe the innovation, innovative answer here is to mobilize they, these people, to get these people who have the knowledge and skills to partner with school principals and help them work together to lead change in our schools. So this is what we've developed. We believe that this is a world-class leadership development program for business leaders and school principals as they work together to de develop change and to lead change at these schools. I want to show you a very quick three-minute video that just gives you an un understanding of how things work, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about what we're starting to see in these schools. We all know that the South African education system is in a desperate situation, but exactly how desperate is it? The stats can be confusing. We hear about improved matric results, but then we hear about the low level of learners making it all the way through the schooling system. How does it all balance out? Well, of the 550,000 learners that sat for their matric exams in 2012, 380,000 passed. That's 74%, which sounds great. So what's the problem? The problem is that this is just a small proportion of the learners that enter grade R each year. The big picture is that we start off with 1,150,000 grade R learners every year but only 550,000 attempt to matric, and only 380,000 of them pass. That means we've lost three quarters of a million children along the way, every year. Or to put it another way, we are gaining three quarters of a million economic dependents every year. That alone is appalling. Worse still is the likelihood that we are losing so many gems the potential Beethovens and Barnards and maybe the next Madiba. Generations lost. Faced with these facts, it's easy to be paralyzed by despair, to feel like there's no hope. The challenge seems overwhelming, but it's not. At Partners for Possibility, we can testify that there is hope and that change is possible. And we can do that because we've achieved change. <coughs> How? by tackling one school at a time. Three years and 120 schools later, we have learned a lot about the South African educational landscape and have fine-tuned a unique solution. So what's our recipe for success? Well, you start by finding one under-resourced school. That part's pretty easy. Next, add one willing school principal you'll usually find an overwhelmed and under-equipped one in the same box as the under-resourced school. Now throw in one business leader. Be sure to choose one that's well ripened with the necessary skills and experience. Mix these ingredients into a well-blended partnership. Then add a leadership course to the mix and blend some more. At this point, you need to spice things up. So drop one professional experienced learning process facilitator into the pot and get the training and coaching underway. Then take your principal and business leader and place them amongst a number of similar partnerships from the same region. Now the flavors are really getting to know each other and it's time to form a circle of five to 10 partnerships that serve as an incubator for solutions. Set the incubator and leave for one year. And what happens during that year? Well, with all the knowledge and skills they've gained, plus the benefit of their grassroots experience and peer and organizational support, the collective partnerships are well-placed to tailor design an improvement plan that addresses their own specific challenges. Solutions for the real world. So now you may be thinking, this all sounds great, but does it work? You bet it does. Since our start in 2010 with one single school, we have rapidly grown to 120 partnerships between school principals and business partners. 120 school communities have embarked on a new journey where paralysis born out of despair is rapidly being transformed into action inspired by hope. By learning and working together, walls are being broken down and bridges are being built between communities that have otherwise remained isolated from each other. But don't just take our word for it. Take these words from a few familiar faces.
That's what we do. So now what are you going to do? So that's how it works. What we're starting to see is as we bring together these business leaders and school principals in these meaningful relationships, communities are being mobilized and South African citizens are reclaiming responsibility for raising our children. For years and years and years, we've been abdicating responsibility and handed our children over to the education departments. And now we're realizing that every single one of us have a role to play. There's a role for lawyers and HR people and IT people and engineers and faith-based communities. And so at every one of these communities, in these schools, we are inviting citizens to reclaim responsibility for raising our children through these partnerships. And citizens are invited to bring their gifts to the schools. So my story, my personal story, is that I've been a partner to Ridwan Samudin, who is a principal in Grassy Park, which is a school on, in the Cape Flats. For those of you who have ever been to South Africa, this is the most under-resourced area of Cape Town. And Cape Town is a beautiful city. I have learned the most amazing things from working with Ridwan. So I've done an MBA. I've been incredibly privileged. I've done an MBA. I've done a doctorate. I've done many leadership courses. But I've realized that my most significant leadership development experience came from working with Ridwan Samudin in this school. So I rate this as the most significant thing that I've ever done. And the question we ask ourselves is, what if business leaders could learn about leadership in our schools while at the same time contributing to positive change. Now this isn't a new idea, it's not that this idea came all the way from South Africa. This idea has been suggested in many other places. So Phil Mervis, many of you may know, talked about the best way to develop consciousness for leaders is to get them out of their comfort zone into areas that are different from their own. Harvard, as you know, have introduced this idea of field, field immersion experiences for leadership development. So in, before you start in Harvard program now, you get sent to South Africa to go and work in one of our under-resourced communities because that's the place where you realize that actually as a business leader, you don't have the answers. So what we've realized is that everybody wants to bring into our schools technology. They want to bring you know, a new IT lab and tablets and everything else. But if that technology doesn't land on fertile ground, it has no impact. So we've been spending our time developing a, a theory and a practice around the readiness for change. What is it that needs to happen in a school? And, we've re and we are proposing that there are four readiness factors that need to be in place before any of these wonderful ideas could actually have the impact it should have. One is that we need a confident and energized principal. We need a principal who is ready to lead change at that school. We need a school management team that's cohesive and aligned. We need a community of teachers who are energized and ready to make the changes that need to happen. And finally, we need a community of parents who are engaged. So what we work with in this program is we support the business leaders and principals to, to focus on these four areas. And then after a year, we say, OK, now you're ready. Go and make the changes that you want to see at the school. And we've, we've realized that you can't just say, go and do that. You have to give them the necessary uh, uh, system around it. So we've, we've created a leadership development program that, that encompasses some community of practice activity. There's some content. There's experiential learning. There's action learning. There's coaching. There's reflection. So a whole process of 150 hours during the first year of these business leaders and principals working together. And at the end of this process, they get an, an accredited leadership development certificate that comes from one of the universities in South Africa, University of the Western Cape, who have recognized that this is the way to develop leaders. It's not about sending people off to business school or have them sit in classrooms. You actually develop leadership capacity by dealing with some tough and difficult issues. So we looked at what is the hierarchy of impactful leadership development and realized that there are these nine things that need to happen, and they have to happen in, and some of them have more impact than others. So to, for example, have some content delivery, that's the bottom of the, of the hierarchy. It's important, but it's not sufficient. So we do provide some content delivery, but we've realized that the, as we go up the hierarchy, 
um, more experiential learning, actual learning, coaching, being part of a learning community, being part of a process over time, being outside of comfort zone, do, working on stuff that matters, make an enormous difference in people's ability to learn and grapple with things. So we, as I said, the, the video showed that we've got 120, we've actually got 155 business leaders and some of them are on these pictures. And what's been amazing for us to watch is how the lives of these business leaders and principals are changed through their relationship. It's not because they learn, it's because they have a relationship with someone who cares. Now if you know a school principal, typically it's one of the most loneliest jobs that you can imagine. These business leaders show up with a willingness to be in the corner. They have the back of these principals, and the principal has someone, they have a buddy that they can talk with. But and also, the business leader gets the opportunity to practice some of these things I've been learning about in a space that's so open for what they have to contribute. So what's happening in these schools, and I'm just going to list, kind of ramble off a list, is first look, firstly, is that the business leaders, our business leaders, are in awe of the principals. Every single time I talk to them, they say, you know, I never knew what these principals are having to deal with. I am in awe of my principal. And then when the principal feel that someone is in awe of me, they stand up taller and they, they, they show up differently at work because they know there's someone, some high profile business leader who believes that what they're doing matters. And the business leaders are learning from the principals. We often have a conversation around who's learning the most? Is the principals learning more from the business leader or the business leaders learning? And without exception, the business leader is saying, I'm learning so much more from this principal than they could learn from me. The principals are supported. Someone said to me recently, I knew this is one of your principals because I walked into the school and the principal was alert and awake. And that's not the case in most of our schools, unfortunately. There's a community of committed parents. Every one of our schools, we don't have a teacher uh, parent association. We have a community of committed parents because that gets, creates an opportunity for us to talk about what does that mean to be a member of a community of committed parents? How do we show up when we're a member of a community of committed parents rather than just being in some association? The, energized, so the teachers are re-energized because what we do is we mobilize the whole community around them and then they realize that what they do matters. So we have more love and appreciation in our schools. We have uh, citizens bringing their gifts. We don't, when the parents say, I don't have money, we say, well, what do you have? Well, I can paint. Well, bring your gift to paint. Or I can read, or I can listen, or I can enjoy being excited about the children. We have learners who have that experience of being at the center of community. We have principals who are confidently leading change. We are seeing what social cohesion means like. As you know, we have a history of apartheid, and typically we are crossing boundaries through this process. White principals or white business leaders are, are, are partnered with black principals, and together they are discovering something about the uniqueness of, and the joy of our diversity. And finally, we are seeing improved academic outcomes. It's not the thing that we started out looking for, but we are starting to see in every one of our schools an improvement in academic outcomes. I'm going to sh end off with sharing five things that I've learned from being Redwan Samudin's partner. So the first thing is I've learned that the delivery vehicle of my expertise is my humanity. And when I go to that school, no one at that school is interested in my, my job or how important I am or how many degrees I, am, I have. But what they're interested to know is whether I care and whether I'm going to keep my promises and whether they can rely on my willingness to see them for their gifts rather than their deficiency. The second thing I've learned is what it means to be helpful. For many years I thought that being helpful means that I will go with a solution. But I've realized that when I replace help with curiosity, something changes in my, in my life as well as in the community of Kanama Primary. Because they are, they are dis rediscovering themselves through my curiosity and interest and care for who they are and what they're doing. I've learned what it means to collaborate across boundaries. My comfort zone has never been stretched in the way it has been in the last few years. So we keep talking about crossing boundaries. 
This is the ultimate in crossing boundaries. Get business leaders out of those comfortable, cushy offices of theirs and get them into the schools. I always love the stories when the business leaders come back from the school and they say to each other, you know what? I spent the whole morning at the school and no one brought me coffee. That's what happens in schools. Or I spent the whole morning at the school and it was so hot or it was so cold or it was so uncomfortable. Exactly. Go and be there and learn what that looks like as opposed to trying to fix our education system from your comfortable cushy office. Fourth thing I've learned is what it, a new definition of leadership. So I grew up in a culture that says leaders have to know and have the answers and give direction and be certain. And that's the case for many educational leaders, is they think that the, way, the role of a leader is to know and have the answers and be certain. And it was in an environment like this that someone one day, after I was being incredibly forceful and lots of ideas, and came to me at the end of the session and she said, Louise, would you mind if I gave you some feedback? Now, I don't know what happens to you in that moment, but that's a very scary moment for me. And I'm in the space and the field of leadership development, but it's still scary to hear anybody say, would you mind if I gave you some feedback? So the only thing I could say is, yes, I would love to have your feedback, to which she responded, let's go for a walk. So there we were walking down the corridor and she said to me, the following words, and it's changed my life and it's changed the lives of many of our school principals in South Africa and our business leaders. She said, Louise, I need you to know what happens to me when you are so certain. My voice goes completely quiet because there is no space in your certainty for my voice to be heard. And then she continued, and what I need you to do is to hold certainty a little more lightly so that there's space for my voice too. So we talk about Mandela was the first leader of Symphonia because he created a space where all the voices could be heard. And what we need in South Africa is for all the voices to be heard, every teacher and every principal to be acknowledged for their contribution and to be given the opportunity to share what they have to share. And then the last thing I've learned, and this has been difficult for me because I grew up believing that I'm not enough. I got that message my whole, whole life. I got the message from my schooling system. I got the message from my parents. I did four degrees, for goodness sake. And I did those degrees because every time I hope that next time my father will tell me that he's proud of me. He's not done that yet. But you know, since I've started to do this program, since I've started to work in schools like many of you do every day, I've discovered that who I am is enough. And that's been a life-changing discovery. And I wish that for every business leader and every educationist in the world, because if we know, if we knew that who are we are is enough, we could go out there every day and be the contribution we meant to be. So we are saying to our beloved leader, Nelson Mandela, that we do believe we can change and transform education in South Africa through active citizenship. So I'm delighted that you gave me the opportunity to share with you our story of hope and possibility. I would love you to help us share our story and to enable more communities to benefit. So if you knew of someone who might be interested in the story about what we're doing in South Africa, we need your help. And uh, we would love you to bring your gifts to South Africa. So I will be available later if anybody wants to have a, come and have a conversation and say, how can you help us do this mammoth task in South Africa? Thank you.